presentation timer on my computer, or computer, not because I'm worried about y'all staying here too long, just to be bluntly honest, blatantly honest, it's because I don't want to stretch out anything that I don't need to stretch out. Amen? <laughs> you know, you, I don't want to be religious and go longer when I don't need to go longer. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all are like, oh, amen, brother. I, I receive that right now for my whole, for my whole family. We receive that. What's your timer? We're going to make sure you're sticking to it. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It says an hour and 15 minutes on it. <laughs> uh, amen. But I just want to, I just want to make sure I, I have a habit. Let me confess some things to you. I have a habit of the Lord giving me a word and, and sometimes getting off of that word and talking about some other things that maybe I shouldn't have talked about that time. And I'll go back and listen to my message and think, man, I, the Lord, he told me to do one thing. But I get so religious in my thinking sometimes that, well, God, I got I to gotta stretch it out further than that. It's got to be longer than 10 minutes, right? But I don't think God cares. I don't think it's in the Bible about any of this, really. You should have three songs and an offering and this, and there should be 12 minutes here. And I just don't think so. I, I believe that we need to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's doing. We have a protocol, but we believe that the presence is over the protocol, <laughs> amen? But we have a protocol, right? Amen and amen. That's why we encourage you to worship. We encourage you to praise. We encourage you to dance. We encourage you to express yourself. And if you get too out of hand, we'll meet with you and talk about it because we love you, right? Not because we're mad at you. It's because we love you. So anyways, we're gonna, last week, how many of you were here last week? If you didn't hear last week's message, you need to. It, it is, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. God is taking our church on a journey. And this journey is called renewing our minds. Amen? He's taking us on a journey that would get us out of the, the old kind of religious ways and things we may have been taught of thinking. And he's taking us to this place of becoming sons and daughters of the Most High King. He's taking us from the identity of sinner saved by grace to sons and daughters and co-heirs with Jesus. That how many of you know the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places with Christ? That we fight from heaven, from hope towards earth. Most of us, when we get in a bad place, we think we're fighting towards hope and towards heaven. We're fighting from the hope and from the answer. Amen. We have the answer. We have the freedom. So last week I talked about how the, uh, in, the, in the Passion Translation in Romans 8.1, it says what? It says, now the case is closed. That there's no longer the accusing voice of the devil. There's no longer, some of y'all like the King James and other versions. Now, therefore, there is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I'm going to tell you what, I love how the Passion Translation puts it. He says, but now the case is closed. I like that. There's no longer an accusing voice of the devil there. How many know that the devil's sitting there and he's accusing you to the Father? And here's Jesus right there interceding as your mediator to the Father and saying, no, that's, that's one of mine, Father. Don't let the devil say that. That's one of ours. That's one of ours. It is so good. That, that, should, that should get you excited. <laughs> that the devil, when you make mistakes, he's accusing you to the Father, and Jesus is standing there saying, no, 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 no. He's continued to continually cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible says. We're going to go into some scripture today, and I believe it's going to challenge a lot of the way you think, and maybe some things you've been taught in your life, but that's okay, because it's all scripture. Amen? How many of y'all believe the word of God is true? That's a good place to be. And I always tell people this, when I disciple them and meet with them, you don't have to believe that's true. So if you're here today and you're new to church and all of that, I believe if you stick around, you'll see that we're not as religious as you might have known people to be. That we actually really believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he's a real person, that he loves you so, so deeply and he wants a relationship with you. But today, I believe that the Bible teaches that Sunday mornings is built around the pastor equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So that's what we do here at Good Shepherd Church. I believe that God is continually to speak to our body as a body. How many of you know that different bodies are unhealthy and healthy in different ways? Does that make sense? Right? Some of y'all's bodies are more healthy than mine. So I believe that there's different bodies, different churches around town or whatever, and God is specifically healing and bringing healing to certain areas of this body. 
And I believe the biggest thing that we need in this body, in this house, and I believe also just in the church in general, is our identity in Christ Jesus. It's who we are now after salvation. This is so important because if you don't understand who you are after being born again, you're not going to know how to live a life like Jesus wants you to live, period. You're just going to struggle with doing the same things over and over again, being bored with church. Listen, if you're bored with church, then I would, I would recommend that maybe that you haven't truly given your all to him. That's a hard word, but that's okay. Because I don't get bored with Jesus. Because I didn't get religion when I got saved. I got Jesus Christ. If you get religion, you'll get bored. You'll get tired. You'll want to give up. You'll get discouraged. But if you get Jesus, everything changes. If you get a relationship with the Holy Spirit of God, everything changes. So last week we talked about how we're not under condemnation. Some of you are like, Pastor, that's one of the verses that everybody remembers always. But let me ask you this. When you make mistakes, last week I talked about when you make mistakes, do you feel like you deserve to be punished for your mistakes still? Even after being saved. And maybe that's not you, but I can tell you I had a huge response from a lot of people who said that was for me. I was taught hellfire and brimstone. My motivation to obey God is because I'm scared of him. My motivation to be obedient to God is because I'm scared he's going to disconnect from me if I don't do what he wants me to do. So I want to obey him simply because I don't want him to disconnect from me. I don't want him, oh God, I screwed up again. I know, leave me alone. You des- I deserve for you to leave me alone. I deserve for you not to speak to me anymore. I deserve not to feel you in worship anymore. Nonsense. Nonsense. My God's a lot better than that. He's way better than that. That actually we learned last week that our motivation as sons and daughters in Christ is our love for him, right? We love him, why? Because he first loved me. I want to obey Jesus' commands, why? Because I'm I'm in love with him. (laughs) Because of what he's done for me. When I think about him dying on the cross, when I think about him being beat and hurt and flesh ripped off his body, I think about, man, Jesus, I don't, I don't want to be disobedient because of what you went for me. He didn't just die for you. He died as you. That was your cross. That was your place. But that's why he's so good. And that's why he says, listen, child, whenever you get saved, when you make mistakes, you don't need to walk around like you still need to be punished. Right? How much of your punishment did Jesus take on the cross? How much? All of it. Completely. All of it. All of it's gone. Some of y'all, man, I I believe in that God will still set you free this week from the motivation of only serving God out of fear that he's going to disconnect from me. My son, when he makes mistakes, what do I do? Do I disconnect from him on purpose and let him feel the wrath of our disconnection no I pursue him I pursue him my son Redding sometimes he just goes on these things where he just loses his freaking mind and yesterday was one of those days my God I was like Jesus are you trying to sanctify me today is this the day and, and, and it was but I remember we got home and he was still acting crazy and we, we, we went to his room and he, he was just yelling and yelling and yelling and I tried spanking him it wasn't working it made him more mad. I was like, this is ridiculous. I was like, go to your room. You need to stay in your room. And he'd go back there. And then I felt the Holy Spirit say, Michael, you pursue him. So I followed him back there. He ran back there and he was crying and he fell on his bed. And I walked back in there with him and I got down on my knees. And instead of saying, you better stop it right now, I just said, man, Holy Spirit, come. I need you. And I said, Ray, what's wrong, buddy? Because I always want, let's connect, son. In the garden with Adam and Eve, what did he say when they screwed up? I mean, y'all freaking screwed up. Now you're going to hell. He said, no, Adam, where are you? Who told you that? Why are you hiding from me? I want to connect with you. And some of us always think, well, then sin came in the world and this terrible thing came. But let me tell you this, that also Jesus was coming. God's idea the whole time was that Jesus would come and build back the reconnection. To build it back with us. And that's what he still does today. That when we're sons and daughters of the Most High King, when we make mistakes, it is precisely the place where God shows us how committed he is 
to maturing us as sons and daughters. And it's not his place where he says, you know what, Michael, man, I saved some wrath for you up here in this room. Let me go get it real quick and let me throw it at you. No, 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 no. He says, Michael, hey, my grace is sufficient for you. And in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. So instead of taking our weaknesses as something to be ashamed of and guilty of and condemned about, it's actually the place where God gets to come in in his mighty strength and power and changes. Amen? Come on, don't look at your weaknesses as, as this big thing in your life. If you read throughout the Old Testament, you'll see that the enemy always tries to show himself as this big thing. The giants, they're too big for us. The enemy wants to highlight your problem like it's way bigger than the answer. But I, I would like to inform you today that we serve a tiny, puny devil. And we serve a mighty, mighty God. A mighty God. A fight between God and the devil is a laughing matter. That's not what's happening. The devil's defeated. He was defeated completely on the cross when Jesus said, it is finished. Death is defeated. Some of you are thinking, well, the devil's still running around. Da, 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 da. Let me tell you this. You know how you give authority to the devil in your life? You obey him. The devil has no authority over you, right? Okay, we're going to get into this before I get off track here. Y'all ready? Today I want to tell you that we are completely free from the bondage of sin. Completely. Look at your neighbor and say completely. I'm going to mess y'all up today. We are completely free from the bondage of sin. And we're going to get through the scripture, and you're not going to be able to disagree because it's the word of God. I mean, you can still disagree. That's your decision. We're not a cult, right? <laughs> you can disagree, but if you're a born-again believer, you can't disagree. It's the word of God, right? So in uh, John 8, verse 11, it says this, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, remember the, the story about the woman caught in adultery, they bring her to Jesus, right? And they're like, what are you gonna do with her? He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn me. That's what we went over last week. You're born, listen, you're not condemned anymore. I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to what? To save it. And then he goes on, this is my favorite part. You ready for this? And go, this is from now on, yeah, the Lex Standard Version, and sin no more. I like that better version. I like that better. Now, why did he say, now, here is Jesus' command. Uh, you're not condemned. Don't be condemned when you make mistakes. But what does he say about that? He says, now go and sin no more. Jesus died so we would go and sin no more. He didn't die to give his grace so we could go and sin some more. Right? Hey, there's victory in this message. I'm not, listen, I, there's no condemnation, right? But Jesus looked at her and said, hey, listen, I don't condemn you. And he looks at us and he says, I don't condemn you. But he says, I charge you from now on, from what you did, what I showed you. Hey, you made a mistake in this area and here's some grace for you. Here's some mercy for you. But let this grace transform you into the image of my son. He says, now go and sin no more. People say, well, what are you saying, that we can be perfect? No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, like Dan Moeller says, that that's how God sees us. Did you hear me? How does God see you? This is important. How does he see you? You need to know this. He sees you wrapped in the righteousness of his son. He sees you with the blood of Jesus that washes every sin away from you. He sees you as his son and his daughter. He sees you completely free. All sin. He died for all of our sins, amen? That's how he sees you. So after God pronounces us forgiven and free from condemnation, he gives us this command to go and sin no more. Since now we are forgiven and there's no condemnation, right? So why even resist sin? This is how some people think, well, God forgives me. He's a forgiving God. He loves me. He's going to forgive me. He's going to love me. Yes, but if that's how your heart is, excuse me, if that's how your heart is, then you really need to check if you really have a relationship with him. Because if I have a relationship with him, I'm not going to be looking for ways that I can take advantage of him. If I have a healthy relationship with my wife, I'm not looking for the little windows and crevices where I can take advantage of our relationship. 
Otherwise, my heart's wicked still. And why is it in the church that we have built a case and an affirmation for sin? Instead of a case and an affirmation for righteousness. Because my Bible says that he that knew no sin became sin on the cross. So why? So that we could become the righteousness of God. Go and sin no more. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from what you're doing. And so they had the same question in Paul in Romans 6. So turn to Romans 6. This is really good. Well, pastor, we're just a bunch of sinners, you know. Just sinning all the time. If you still have a deep relationship with sin, you need to be born again. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. If you still have a deep relationship with sin and it rules your life, you need to be born again. You need salvation this morning. You need to understand that he set you free from the bondage of sin. Not to have a little relationship with it any longer. Not to have a little pet with sin, but to be completely free and understand that you walk in the pureness and righteousness of who Jesus was. Completely. Romans 6, this is so good. They say to him, Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Basically, it's like this. Well, when I sin, it gives God an opportunity to give me grace, which glorifies how good he is. Right? Right? God giving us grace shows the world how good he is, so why even resist sin? The more I sin, the more grace God gives me, and the more he's glorified. And Paul answers them and says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase, right? By no means. Other versions say, certainly not. That's not what I'm saying. He's saying that your heart, if that's how your heart still is, then your heart's still wicked. How many of you know it's all about your heart? You know, I I changed my stance on on suicide. I just feel led to tell this right now. Maybe you'll disagree, and that's okay. But it's all about people's heart. Some of us have been taught that everybody who commits suicide goes to hell, and I don't believe that. I don't believe that. It's all about your heart. Because our sin has been eradicated on the cross. So if I go home and be harsh with my wife and get in a car crash and die, before I said sorry to God, am I going to go to heaven or hell? Some of y'all don't know how to answer that. You need to answer that. There's no longer any condemnation for me. If my heart, if I made a mistake, God knows my heart. He knows, but if I go home every single Monday after church and I get up here and preach and act like I love you guys and God is so good and I go home and treat my family horribly every week, that's different. That shows my heart is not good, right? Right? That shows my heart is actually still wicked. My heart is actually maybe got a hold of some religion but didn't get a hold of Jesus because if it got a hold of Jesus that I would change. So I love what he says here. By no means, we are those who have died to sin. We're dead to sin. That's what the Bible says. We're di- we have died to sin. And I love this next verse. How can we live in it any longer? Maddie told me this morning, she said, this is gonna be the most important part of the sermon series you're really preaching on about identity. Because the devil wants us to identify ourselves as sinners instead of sons. And guess what? When we identify ourselves still as sinners, guess what we do by nature? We just sin and we build a case for it. Well, we're not perfect, brother. I'm human. Okay, well, I would like to tell you this morning that so is Jesus. Right? We believe that Jesus was fully God and fully human, but did not sin. That's what separated Jesus from the prophets of old. Why? Because he was sinless. That's amazing. That's good news. So he says, we have died to sin. Somebody said dead to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So yes, there's forgiveness. Yes, there are these things, but the Bible clearly teaches go and sin no more. It's all through it. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not a license to sin. There were people who were teaching that sin was not a big deal. They were called Gnostics, Gnosticism. It was in 1 John, right? He said the grace, they were saying sin's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. You got to sin here. You don't have to really stop that. And John came in to tell him, no, that's wrong. (laughs) Absolutely not. If your heart is continually in a place of enjoying sin, then you need to be born again. (sighs) You need to be born again. Right? I'm telling you, I got saved in jail and I got saved in hospitals. I got saved lots of places, but I, don't, I never got born again. <laughs> I, wanted, 
I wanted the good stuff that God had to offer, but I, I wanted, I guess you could say, I wanted him to be my savior, but he didn't, I didn't want him to be Lord of my life. I wanted him to save me from hell and my sin, but I didn't want him to be in charge. I didn't want him to now tell me what I should do. I just want to say, hey, God, let me get out of this horrible situation. Help me get out of this jail cell. Help me not die. And the Lord, he saved me. I, I flatlined overdose one time, and the Lord, I remember praying. I remember there was something after that that happened. And I remember scared to death, literally thinking, I am going to hell. <laughs> I was thinking, I've screwed up. I've missed it. And I remember praying and saying, God, help me, help me, help me. And he did. And, and, and I came and I I was, I was good. I was on all this medication. I was in the hospital. And I could imagine, I remember Jesus saying, go and sin no more, Michael. And then he tells in another part of the gospels, do you remember the part with the guy that he has crippled? He said, go and sin no more, lest something worse happen to you. Whew. That is my story, I promise you. Because God saved me from death over and over and over again. I believe because of the prayers of people even in this room. Come on, look how good he is. <laughs> look how good he is. Some of y'all were sincerely praying for me. Bless you. You have an inheritance in everything that I do for Jesus. That's what I tell my mom all the time. Don't be discouraged, mom. Don't listen. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here at all. Amen? So grace is not a license to sin. Grace is there to transform us into the image of Christ. God gives us grace so we change not so we continue to enjoy sin. Amen? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach, well, hey, buddy, there's grace for you. Don't, don't worry about it. No, 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 no. The Apostle Paul told us over and over again, crucify your flesh. Do you know what the crucify means? Do you know what that really means, the crucifixion? Murder. Murder. Take it really serious. Take it extremely serious that when your flesh comes up and you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, kill it. Why? Romans 8, 29. Look in your Bible, so that's verse. This is so good. We'll go to one of the Calvinist verses that they misinterpret. Uh-oh. <laughs> I can do that, right? Don't worry, they're not listening to my sermons, I promise. Romans 8, 29. I love what the Passion Translation says. Some of you are thinking, what's this Passion Translation? Lord, please rebuke that religious spirit in this place too. Amen. He says this, he said, for those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed, go back please. To share the likeness of his son. There we go. This means that the son is the oldest among a vast family, brothers and sisters, who will become just like him. Let's read that again. For he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son, to be like him. This means the son, which is Jesus, is the oldest among a vast family. Why is he the oldest? Because he was the first one who rose from the grave. Right? He was the first one. This means the son is the oldest and most of vast family and brothers and sisters who will become just like him. How many of you know that the Bible teaches that throughout your life you are becoming just like Jesus? What does that mean? It's called sanctification. Or another good or easy word to understand, holiness. Be holy, for I am holy. God's saying, what does the word holy mean? Be separate, set apart, come out from among them. It doesn't mean that you take your Bible everywhere you go, brother. Mm. I always have my Bible with me. It doesn't mean that you're at church every single day on time. It doesn't mean that I've always tithed every single little penny. That doesn't mean you're holy. What means you're holy is that you're set apart from the world like Jesus was. And let me give you another token real quick. Jesus was set apart from the religious people. I had a guy tell me something really recently that really got me together. He did a service being scour at. He said, when revival really hits, he said, more people won't like it than like it. How many of you know that revival hit when Jesus was born and people didn't like it? Revival hit when he was walking around the areas healing the sick and raising the dead and people didn't care for it. I believe that you people in this place love Jesus and not religion, amen? So God, when we get saved, he's put us on a journey. I'm trying to teach some things this morning, right? I'm not gonna say I have this big prophetic word that we're releasing over the church, no. I believe we're teaching some fundamental truths 
that will help you actually live out your life. So Romans 8, 29 says that you will become just like him. So how does that happen? That means that you take every opportunity to kill the crap that tries to raise itself, its ugly head in you, you kill it. How do you become just like him? What did he do? He didn't sin. The more and more you crucify your flesh and not choose to sin, the more and more you look like Jesus. Amen. And how many of you know that the world needs to see Jesus? And when we choose to enjoy our sin and and stomp on the grace of God, the world does not see Jesus. They just see religion and hypocrisy. But when we we stand up and we man up and say, yeah, I used to be really angry. I used to be full of rage. And even after I got saved, I was still struggling with this. But God has set me free because in those moments, I chose to kill it. You have a choice. The enemy wants you to think that you don't have a choice. The devil wants you to think that sin is still in control of you. And that way, when you sin, you're just like, well, brother, we're all sinners. We still got a sinful nature. But my Bible just read that we're dead to sin. My Bible also reads that we're dead to him, or dead to sin and alive to Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And guess what? There's no sin in him. The Bible says in 1 John that there is no darkness in him. He is the light of the world and there is no darkness in him at all. And where is he? He's in me. Amen? You know something I do for the men in this place? If you're a man, you probably have the temptation of lust, I'm sure. Some of you are like, oh, no, brother, not me. Good for you. (laughs) Good for you. Let's be real. But there's always this temptation. The devil's after you, whatever he can. You see a girl out, whatever it is. I'll see girls out, whatever it is. And something I've started doing is so, so good. I've started to speak out. Whenever I see those situations, temptation, I will literally speak out loud, I'm pure. You know why? Because Jesus is in me and he's not perverted. He's not perverted and he's in me and I put on his righteousness. Sin does not control me. I don't call my pastor, hey, pastor, can you pray for me? I'm perverted. (laughs) Well, if that's true, you may need to get born again. Right? Come on. No, 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 no. I, I, I lift my hands to Jesus and I say, Father, I thank you that I'm pure and righteous in your sight. And there's nothing in me that wants to disobey you. Nothing. Nothing in my spirit. You know, come on, let's read you another Bible verse. So some of you are like, I don't know if I believe that. Kill that thing. Look at your neighbor and say, kill it. We all have our own little sin struggles. All I'm trying to say to you today is, is that that you shouldn't just be best friends with the sin struggle in your life and acting like it's not big a deal. That's exactly what he was just saying during the offering. We should take it seriously. We should not see all the little sins in our life and think this is not a big deal, man. It's just, I'm I'm not cheating on my wife. I'm not doing drugs anymore. Did you know there's actually a place of bondage in the idea that I'm better than I was? That is a good word. You know what the Lord gave me that word at? I was in the elevator at the hospital. Because I was sitting there thinking to myself, well, I'm better than I was. And the Lord said, there's actually a bondage in that place because you're not better than you were. You're completely free from this. You're completely free. And when when we get in the habit of saying I'm better than I am, you know what we do? We make that an excuse to stay that way. We make it an excuse for our sin in our life still. Well, brother, you should have seen me 10 years ago. Well, I'm gonna tell you, if you see me right now and you see me 10 years from now, I promise you, I'm gonna look more and more like my father more and more like him I promise you not because I'm prideful not because I'm arrogant because I'm a son who wants to obey my daddy because of what he did for me on the cross hallelujah because I love him because he first loved me then when I was yet a sinner he demonstrated his love for me by sending his own son to die on the cross for me that's why it'll happen that's why I obey him that's why my heart's desire is to do whatever he wants from me. And some of you are think, well, pastor, do you do it all the time? No, that's not what I'm saying. If that's what you're thinking this whole time, you've missed everything I've said. I'm saying, I won't bring out the Bible verse that says be perfect because it's in there. Google it right now if you like. Some of you are thinking I need, to, I need to study into that a little more. Let me give you another advice. Don't study scripture without the Holy Spirit. Don't study scripture without the Holy Ghost because my Bible also says that the Holy Spirit's coming to lead you into all truth. Who leads you in the truth? The Holy Ghost, period. 
God, you need to get alone with your Bible and get alone in prayer and get alone in worship. God, you need to reveal these things to me. What Pastor Mike said today challenged me. I thought we were all sinners and we're, I just sin all the time. Da, 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 da. No, 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 no. My Bible says you're dead to sin. Completely dead to sin. Jesus says multiple times, go and sin no more. Why would he say that? Because he wants you to know that you're free. Because if we wake up every day, how many of you know that you have to become something before you can act like it? I was telling Maddie, you have to become a police officer before you can have the attributes of a police officer. You have to be made righteous before you'll bear righteous fruit. You have to be a son before you'll act like a son. You're not trying to act like one, you are one. You're not trying to hit the mark. Jesus hit the mark already. You're not trying to do it all right. Jesus already did it all right for you. So go and live it out and and crucify the junk in your life and let God transform you and mature you into looking just like him. That's a good word. I'm preaching to myself. I feel good this morning. Well, pastor, is 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 it possible to not sin at all for a whole day? Absolutely. Absolutely, my God. Is it possible to not sin at all for maybe a week? Absolutely. Oh, man. Some of you are like, oh, goodness. What church did we come to today? Galatians 5, 16. Turn in your Bible. Let me show you. Galatians, can you put that up on the screen, please? Galatians 5, 16. How many of y'all actually have a physical Bible? Good for you. Galatians 5, 16. As you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. Let me put it a simpler way even. Walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? Obey. The Holy Spirit's that little voice is saying, don't do that again. You know that way you always react with your wife and you're not supposed to? Stop. You know that way you're always kind of perverted when you watch this show or do whatever? Stop. Turn it off. If you walk in the spirit, if you're constantly listening to what the Holy Spirit's trying to renew your mind and tell you what to do, it says that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It does not say walk in the spirit and every other day you'll, you'll gratify the desires of the flesh, but it's okay. Well, that, that's true. But he's saying that if you, you're always gonna have the opportunity to obey the Lord. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's there to empower you. I'd like to tell you this morning, how many of y'all ever get, I don't know about you, but I like to ask crazy questions about the Bible to God. And I don't think he's afraid of it. Because I think about Jesus being sinless and sometimes I think that's not very impressive. I think about how Jesus was sinless and I'm like, well, God, I'm not impressed, he's God. Right? I think, well, that's not very impressive. He was still God. He was completely divine. Of course, he didn't sin. But I believe this. You have to understand whether or not you believe that Jesus could sin or not. And I believe he absolutely could. I believe that he was completely a human. Completely human and completely God. And I don't know how to explain that, neither do you. But all I know is if he was not completely human, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, then we cannot relate to him. My Bible teaches that actually we can relate to him because he's been tempted in every way. But you know what he did? He chose the Father's will instead of his own. And he made it possible for us to choose it as well. Man, that's good. Such a good word. He made it possible that sin no longer has a hold on me. I'm no longer a slave to this sin. But my Bible teaches I'm a slave to what? Righteousness. I used to be a slave to sin. I think we've preached a doctrine in the church that actually says after we get born again, we're still slaves to sin. It's not in there. It's not in the word. Some of you are thinking about, well, what about Romans 7? Well, I believe Romans 7 is pre-conversion. I believe at the end of it, Paul says what? He says, what should I say, oh, wicked man and be? Then he says, oh, thanks be to God. Oh, wow, here's the answer. (laughs) He builds a whole case. You know what the problem is? We build a whole doctrine out of a couple verses. That's where you get screwed up. Right? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm free from sin. Here you go. I'm going to give you some practical advice now. Raise your hand if this makes any sense to you at all. 
Good, four of you. Praise God. It's worth it. <laughs> Thanks, TJ. So can you go a week without sinning? Some of y'all are thinking, well, I can't, I can't do that, man. That's crazy. I probably sin six times a day. His grace is sufficient for you. And your weakness, his strength is made perfect. But if you're going around and making excuses for your sin, then you need to be born again. If sin rules you, Christ does not rule you. Amen? This is good news. <laughs> this is good news. This is the best news ever. That I don't longer have to wake up every day thinking, man, I hope I don't sin today. Golly, I hope I don't sin. Instead, I get to wake up and say, man, Lord, even if I make a mistake today and stumble and fall, there's no condemnation for me. And I'm alive to you, Jesus. And sin does not hold me down. I have people call me and they'll say things like, hey, man, can you pray for me? I, I've wanted to cheat on my wife. I, I've wanted to, uh, it's moved past pornography and now it's to the place of cheating on my wife. I said, I'm not gonna pray that you'll stop wanting to cheat on your wife. I'm gonna start praying that you believe that you're a son of God and you're free from your sin. I'm gonna pray that actually that the old has passed away and all things have become new. I'm gonna pray that you start to believe that you are who God says you are. Somebody, like, oh man, sorry for calling. <laughs> I tell you what I do, I think about those thoughts. I say, Lord, I thank you so much that I don't wanna cheat on my wife. How ridiculous. How many of you know just because you have temptations doesn't mean that's how you actually are? You're not identified by your temptations. You are not identified by your sin struggles. You are identified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are identified by God's one and only son. And he loves you and God looks over him and says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased and I get to step into that inheritance just like Jesus. He's well pleased with me. And when I think like this, you know what it does? It makes me walk a life free of worrying about how I'm gonna sin and actually look for opportunities for righteousness to manifest itself in my life. I'm actually looking for opportunities where God is gonna show me that I've already become the righteousness of God. Wow, I should expect to get more and more like Jesus in my life instead of expecting for this sin struggle that I have to rule me for the next 25 years. Amen? Man, that's good. That's good news. That's the gospel, <laughs> which means good news, right? Bad news would be, I did all this for you. I stretched out on the cross for you. I gave everything for you and sin's still gonna control you. That's bad news. That's not the gospel. You're completely free. I'm gonna give you a practical way to fight sin in your life. How many of you know that your thoughts are weapons against you? The devil will use your thoughts as weapons against you. Your thought, listen, your, your mind is a battlefield. There's a book, by, I think it's Joyce Meyer, called The Battlefield of the Mind. Read it. Ser seriously. Spirit Wars, another one by Chris Dowell and some stuff he said will kind of challenge you. That's okay. How many of you know you can chew up the meat and pick out the bones? I'm not afraid to listen to anybody preach or anybody. I'm not afraid of nothing. I'm, I know what I believe. I didn't, I'm like the Apostle Paul. I didn't receive it. I didn't receive it from man. I wasn't taught it from any man, but I received a revelation from Jesus Christ. That's what we need. <laughs> Somebody talked you into it. You could probably be talked out of it. But when you experience Jesus for yourself, I promise you, you're not going to go anywhere. Thank you, Lord. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. I love this. This is a Passion Translation. Y'all have it up there. I'm so proud of y'all, man. That's awesome. Thanks, BD, bro. Pastor Daryl. Good to see you. We're almost done. We're going to clean up, and you guys are going to beat the Baptist to the buffet this morning. You know what would bless me so much? I've heard two testimonies this past week about how people have reached out to their servers at the restaurants and prayed with them and blessed them. Listen, if you do not tip well, do not invite people to this church. I'm serious. And if you're mean to your server and stuff, don't even talk. Don't even talk about the Lord. Because I promise you, I go to the jails and half the people in the room tell me they don't ever want to come to church because they know mean religious people 
And I try to tell him, hey, no, man, come, because there's people like Jim Wagner in my church that love you no matter what. And he's not a mean religious person. And he's never been on drugs. He's never done any of those crazy things. But he would love to see you there. Don't not come for the bad reasons. Come come for the good reasons. All the people in this room need Jesus just as much as anybody else, whether or not they realize that or not. That's on them. (laughs) But I love, uh, man, my brother's not here today. I'll brag on him. Some of y'all know my brother. I love my brother to death. It was my brother who, who tried to get me in church for years. It was my brother who accepted me when I was strung out and out there doing crazy things. And he, Michael, come to church with me, come to church with me, come to church with me. If you've been going here very long, you understand that my heart is that you would understand who you are in Christ and you would take it out and realize that God wants you to reach lost people in this city. But you cannot give away something that you don't own. You hearing me? You cannot give away something you don't own. That's why we're pushing on identity. That's why we're going to go through this until it sticks because you can't give away something you don't own. I don't need you to give away Holy Ghost or just come into the church and just do whatever. I need you to give away sonship to people. I need you to show this city that they are missing out on the something that you have. And half of them will never make it into this building, but they will see you at Red Lobster. And so my brother was talking to me about how they prayed for their server. It was pretty funny because this server just started opening up like all this junk in their life. It was almost made it impossible not to pray for them. You know, it's kind of like when your server's like, man, my, my life's just falling completely apart and everything's just doing terrible. I wish I had some hope, but what do you guys want to drink? <laughs> if you miss that opportunity, smack yourself, okay? That's, the, that's when God is just, he's, he's spoon feeding you something. Oh, I know, because I've asked people what their names were, and I was completely wrong, and I just kept on walking. I was like, oh, is your name Jonathan? They're like, nope. I'm like, okay. Sorry, you look like somebody I knew, you know? <laughs> and then I lied, you know, and then sinned. It was terrible. There's no condemnation for me, right? But I'm learning. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm learning. His grace is helping me learn. <laughs> it's transforming me. All right, real quickly, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like prisoners of war. That's how, that's how serious we should be. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist, somebody say insist, that it bow in obedience to the anointed one who is Jesus, Right? You got to fix your thought life if you're going to fix your actions. I promise you it's called sanctification. And how do you know what you're supposed to be thinking and doing? By reading the word of God. You cannot have a relationship. Man, come on, man. You're not going to grow sincerely in a relationship with the Lord if you don't get into your word. Because it's the word that is the truth. Whenever you're thinking about what's true and God, what are you saying? You can know concrete what he's saying in his word. Amen. You need to know your word. Why? Because it renews our mind. I had somebody in this church tell me before, Michael, I was praying about why you have so much success, Michael, why I see people on drugs and they never get to where you are. And she said, the Lord spoke to her and says, because how much time I spent in the word. I spent 10 hours a day. Now, granted, I was in jail. A little easier. Not a lot to do in there. But it took me. God started to change the way I think because I start to see how Jesus acted. I start to see what the word says. It tells me what sin is. You know, uh, fornication, drunkenness, all this stuff, it tells me. So I don't have to wonder what it is, right? But the Bible says this, when you have thoughts in your mind that say, go do this and do this, you have the power to capture that thought like a prisoner and make it submit to Jesus. Amen? You have the power. That, That verse did not say, well, when that stuff rises up against you, it overtakes you and you go and sin. No, God gives us the practical information. Capture it. Make it submit to the obedience of Jesus. What did Jesus do? He said, not my will, Father, but yours be done. That's sanctification in a nutshell. Not my will, God. Not not, not my, my sinful nature, but your spirit, God, be done. Amen? Amen or oh me. Let's stand to our feet. And the worship team will come, please. So I believe that Bible teaches that sin should be a very minimum detail of our lives, amen? How many of y'all agree with that? 
our life should not be characterized by sin any longer. And listen to me. If you're born again in this room and you just have this sin that you just, you just feel like you can't shake, I want you to know that the one who the Son set free is free indeed. You're completely free. It is for freedom Christ has set us free. Right? And the Bible also says the truth will set you free. I believe what was presented to you this morning was truth. I believe it was objective truth. I believe that it's true no matter what anyone thinks about it. I believe Jesus is an objective truth. Whether or not you believe he's the son of God, the way I believe is, is that it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It's kind of offensive. But I can tell you, since I believe that, it's changed my life from the inside out. And it's gave me and brought me places I never thought I would ever go. Where people actually invite me to even come to their church and preach. Don't even know, and, they, and I get this, they even know how crazy I was. Hey man, they, some of you people were even crazy enough to vote on me to be your pastor. You guys are crazy. You guys must trust the Lord. Amen. Can we just thank God right now that we belong to Jesus? Thank you, Lord. Come on. Thank you, God. And thank him for his grace and forgiveness. Listen, can you thank him right now for his grace and forgiveness when you do sin? Because the Bible says in 1 John, he says, I write this to you, dear children, so that you will not sin. Whoa. That's deep. But then he says this, but if anybody does sin, he knows he didn't say when. I love what Dan Muller says. He says, I don't have an appointment with sin. I have an appointment with righteousness. I don't have an appointment. But he says, but if anybody sins, don't leave this place feeling condemned that you go out and make a mistake tomorrow. The Bible teaches, but if you do sin, we have one who speaks to the Father on our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That's good news. Not when you do, but if you do. If you do, let God's grace move your heart so much that you don't want to do it anymore. Let God's grace move your heart so much. Man, Lamentations in chapter 3, I think it's 23. It says, every morning there's brand new mercies for me. God doesn't give us a brand new box of mercy so we say, oh God, here's some brand new mercy. I can go live however the crap I want to. He gives us brand new mercies every morning even though we had a bad day the day before. So we wake up and we're moved. We're moved because he's so good to us. We're moved because how, how could he come to me with mercy this morning? Look how bad I screwed up yesterday. But he says, no, 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 no. It's a new day, Pastor Daryl. It's a new day, Maddie. It's a new day, John. And here's some new mercy. Hallelujah. Listen, there's freedom in this place right now. If you, prayer team, come quickly. If I've asked you to be on the prayer team before, you go ahead and come as well. There is freedom in this house. There is freedom in this house. There is freedom for people who are born again. You've been saved for years. And your life has just been full of junk. And maybe you're here today and you say, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus, but I need to. This is the perfect message to get born again to. Because now you know that you're free. If you'd be bold enough right now to say, I need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I need salvation. I need to be born again. I need to give him my life completely because I want to live for him because of what he did for me. I want you to just go ahead and walk down here. All these people want to pray with you right now. You know, I had a lady message me last week when we talked about standing up because of being condemned and all these things. She said, everybody in that church should have been standing to their feet. If you've been living a life that has been affirming the sin in your life, I want you to come to the altars and let somebody pray with you or just come at the altar and kneel and they'll make room for you. If you've been living a life saying, you know what, this sin's not a big deal. It's no big deal in my life, but because God loves me, it's not a big deal. That's wrong. He wants us to kill that stuff. If that's you, I want you to come down here right now. If you need healing in your body, I want you to come down here right now and let us pray for you. If you need someone just to encourage you and pray for you about anything, I want you to go ahead and leave your seat and come. Now do me a favor, look at your neighbor. And say, do you need any of those things?
Some of y'all ain't doing it because you're scared of the answer. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, do you need any of those things? I love you. And say, I'll go with you and grab them by the hand and bring them down here. If you know somebody you're with needs salvation, you can pray with them right there. I don't care. But I want you to come down to these altars right now. Anybody else in this room, I need to repent. I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to stop living a life in affirming sin. I need to be free completely. Just go ahead and come down here. We want to pray for you. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. There is freedom in taking action to your convictions. Don't let pride keep you from someone praying with you and encouraging you. Don't let it keep you. I'm going to give you another second or two just to respond to the message today. If you just even want to come to the altar, I want you to come now. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, can we just close our eyes right now in this place? We love you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. God, I thank you that we are completely set free from sin, God. I thank you, Jesus, that you're full of mercy and loving kindness, and it draws us to repentance, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for us, Lord, when we're weak then you are strong. I thank you, God, that you're equipping the saints, Lord, to be able to walk in their royal identity, Father, to go out and give it away to people in this city, to give it away at home to their children, Father. If I just lift out your hands like this to receive from the Lord. And Father, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that every single verse and every single revelation that was for them, God, you would show it to them right now. And they would, they would just not be able to just release it, God, until you've shown them, God, how loved they are and how free that they are, Jesus. That they would receive that freedom right now in Jesus' mighty name. We love you, Lord. We bless you. Bless their families. Bless their children, God. Lord, we do all of this for your glory, Father. And we pray, Holy Spirit, continue to pour out wisdom and revelation in this house. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, and all God's people said,